I'm here with Mark Iglarsh, yes, who is are. a criminal defense attorney here in South Florida. I am. Brilliant legal mind, and I, we've, this has been in the works for so long, but I'm so happy you're here. Tell everyone who you are. All right, I'm love. I play the role of a father, a lawyer, um, a legal analyst, a pickleball player. Who am I is the same thing that I think who you are at the core. And I know you didn't want to go that deep at the core. I believe we're all just bundles of light and love. And then we all play roles, right? You're playing the role of whatever you are right now. You're just playing that role deep down inside. That's who you are. You're nothing but love and light. I love it. You know what? It's the first time I've asked someone who they are and they didn't introduce themselves by their name and their profession. Well, what happens if they get disbarred? Are they no longer alive? You know, if they're no, if their kids die, are they no longer? Uh, who are you? Well, I'm a father. Well, wait a second. What if you don't have kids anymore, let's say? or No. So who really are you? I've been down this road. I wrote a book about happiness, so it's a little deeper. Who are you at the core? I mean, you know, who are you? Mark, tell everyone a little bit about the book that you wrote. You talked about this book about happiness, and I remember hearing about it. And I know you give keynote spe like speeches and stuff. What is this book? Tell me about it. It's called Be Happy by Choice, Happiness Guaranteed, or Your Misery Back. So if you go to BeHappyByChoice.com, you can see that side of me. And it came because I went through some wonderful growing opportunities that I call pain also. So if anyone's going through pain, it's a wonderful thing because it either takes you down to Chinatown or you grow from it. I grew from it. So did my wife. So we each wrote books and it teaches people tools of how to change their thoughts so they can change how they feel, so they can change how they show up. You understand? Thought, feeling, manifestation. So if you look in the mirror and you go, oh my God, I'm so fat. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not filling the blank enough. Then you feel horribly. And then you show up like, eh, nice talking with you. Yeah. You're not so, confident. No, not feeling good. No, 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 no. So again, there's things like gratitude, random acts of kindness, meditation, things that I focus on to try to help people change their thoughts to change how they feel. And it's funny because you say that, that's like literally my life. Right. Like I try to incorporate everything that you just said every single day in my life is doing something for others. Right. Being uh, having positive self-talk to yourself. I always I try to at least listen to something positive every single day, whether I'm it could be Joel Osteen in my car on the way to work, even though I'm not you know, it's not religious, but it's a powerful message of just positivity. Absolutely. First of all, shut the damn news off because it's not positive. I don't want to, if it bleeds, it leads. That's what they're, they're so they're, I'm going to, I'm going to, how do I feel after watching bleeding all over the place, right? So I don't do the news as much uh, anymore. I'll just kind of read the headlines and decide whether I want to delve into it or not. Um, I'm just very discerning about what I allow into my head. Yeah, there's a couple really good people that like I listen to. There's Tony Robbins and then there's, I don't know if you know Jim Rohn. You ever listen to Jim Rohn stuff? I've seen stuff. Who's it is. brilliant, but that's the whole idea of is what is it that you're feeding yourself? What's you, what are you feeding your mind? Are you waking up? and reading the news stories about all this horrific stuff that's going on, or are you doing something positive? Are you writing something that you know, you're know you grateful for down? Things like that. Community service is the rent that we pay for the space that we take up on earth, right? So my goal is to pay as much rent as I possibly can. Selfishly, when I help others, it helps me. So when I pull over the side of the road because I see some guy in a dilapidated, broken down truck and he's got a, a flat tire, I literally will get out hand him a large bill and just drive away. And then in my rear view, just look at his reaction because it makes me feel good, right? Nothing. I don't need anything. I don't want... Um, yesterday, we went to see um, Ain't Too Proud to Beg at the Arts Center. My wife and I, we've been subscribers for years. So we're sitting literally fifth row center, very grateful, proud to be there. And to my left were two empty seats. At intermission, I went up to the fourth floor. Um, I found two people, a mother and a daughter. And I said, you guys... Just you two, come with me. And they sat next to us, and now they could see the faces. Wow. I've sat fourth level at shows before. I know what that's like, rarely, but I have, and I know that it's a different experience. So, and what's so unique um, about the, the, the attitude that you have, the book that you've written, and all of this stuff is that you also have a profession where you are interacting with a very difficult area of law and people who may not be living that life, people who may may be doing bad things, harming other people. How do you? How are you do talking you... about judges? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at... I made a joke. 
not all of them, but there is some truth to that. Some of them are as cantankerous as hell, and they're the orchestrators of their courtroom. So if they're miserable, how do you think everybody around them is? Uh, there's a whole different energy if you go to different courtrooms, right? And prosecutors, right? So what do I, and the people I think you're referring to that I represent, who are actually on their best behavior, quite frankly. I'm not, the, I'm not yeah. going to get into the judges and the other people that I deal with, because listen, I deal with very difficult attorneys on the other side sometimes. I deal sometimes with very difficult judges. You wonder to yourself, how is it that they make certain decisions? How do they come to the conclusions they make? Why do they treat certain lawyers? I mean, it's, there's nothing better than being in front of a judge that treats you with respect. Right. And they let you do what you right. want to do and, right. and, and within the confines of the law. But then there's some people, they just run their own show and they're not, you know. So here's the deal. Whether it's a judge or a prosecutor or a bailiff or anyone you're going to run into in traffic, I mean, metaphorically, not actually, you can't control how someone's going to treat you. I tried to control everybody around me. That didn't work out for me, okay? I had to learn that in my 55 years, okay? I know how young Lizzie looked. Um, but what I did learn was I can control my reaction to everybody around me, okay? It's my reaction to that person in traffic. Is that person, am I gonna surrender leadership of myself for about a mile to catch up to them and give them what they need, right? Or am I gonna like say, all right, maybe their wife's water broke or something and they need to get to the hospital. Or maybe there's just a colossal a-hole and I don't want to have anything to do with them, you know? Why would I risk my liberty and 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 my my life, you know, to 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 have it out with them? So I do the things the minute I wake up in the morning, I begin those spiritual things that I do to help me stay fit. Now, that and I mean spiritually fit. That doesn't mean I'm always at my on my game, but I'm much better today than I ever was. I will tell you I could be a much better person if I stopped drinking coffee. It, the caffeine just gets me okay, insane. Okay, so what's stopping you? That's just too good. It's too good. But wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Walk us through your daily routine. You're talking about that there are things that you do to stay spiritually fit. Not daily routine. Your morning routine. What okay. is your morning routine like? I get up and I immediately begin a dialogue in my head with somebody that I call God, but it could be any higher power. It's not a religious thing. I believe. I look at my three children. I marvel at them. I know that there's, and deja vu, and weird things that, that are out there that I just go, all right, there's got to be a higher power. I've chosen to believe that there's a higher power out there, okay? I'll call him God. I'll call her God. Whatever, it's a God of my understanding. And I immediately say, allow me to be of service today. How can I be of service? Let me be of maximum service today. Whereas I used to say, oh, I hope I win the lottery. I hope I get this. I get that. It's not about that anymore. It's about how I can be of maximum service today. And what I learned selfishly is it all comes back to me, Right? So that's the first thing I do. I then begin to connect whoever's birthday it is. I go to Facebook. I send everybody a birthday message. I stop doing everyone because I'm like, you know, getting messages back from some woman's daughter saying, you know, she died a few years ago. Why are you wishing her happy birthday? So no good, good deed goes unpunished, right? So I just send out messages and I start putting things in the world. I'm doing something called Happiness Guaranteed in 30 through the Florida bars, my third year of doing it where I then send out emails on the listserv to all the people participating, sending them carefully crafted emails with quotations and inspirational messages from me, you know, that Mondays used to be the toughest thing for me, you know, and, but here's what I do. And people write back like, wow, this is great. Um, I meditate. I work out for the release of endorphins. I do random acts of kindness. I'm constantly this, doing things. Is this thing. every morning? Like, is this your basic morning routine? Yes. Like you incorporate it? Yes, because if I don't do it, I go to court or I come here or I drive in traffic and then boom, I'm more vulnerable. If I'm not constantly wearing my spiritual coat of armor, you know, if I don't constantly do it, then I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable, man. When did you start? Like, when did this start in your life? You said you're 55 years old. I'm 42. When did you start to incorporate the change that you're talking about, the morning routine where you're actually doing things for others? I, well... My entire life, I mean, I didn't just, I wasn't a selfish prick and then all of a sudden I started giving to others. So I, I got that concept, you know, from very young. But when did I say, this is something I need to do, like I need to eat and drink water and make it part of my life? Probably a good 15 years ago when I was not just metaphorically on my knees. I was literally on my knees with such pain from whatever I was going through that I said, all right, there, you know, there's got to be a better way, you know? And, and I could tell you my victim story, but it's not necessary. Everybody's got a victim story. We all have it. So whatever those facts are, it's time to change or not, you know? I've tried to incorporate that and I've gotten better and it's really, it's only been the past couple of years, but constantly, I'm constantly trying to think whenever I see, whenever I have an opportunity to either send someone a gift or if I see someone thought about me, like I always think to myself, I need to follow up. I need to do something nice for them. 
You know, it just, it has to be, it has to be like, hey, they just thought of me? I can't believe that. And then want to wow somebody. Okay, good. So it's just something that I'm, I'm working on also. But, but be gentle with yourself. I see you like, I could be a better person if I do this. If I get, we are, we are, we are going to accept the fact that you're going to die with not achieving everything that you set for yourself personally and professionally. But that's, that, but that, but that, that there's some relief and comfort in that. In other words, no matter how many people I helped, it's this much. It's nothing. It's, it's, it really is nothing. In the scheme of things, if it's if it's anything more than that, then that's your ego who's not your amigo. Like, look at all that I did today. No, that's, it's, not, what it's it's not, that's not what it's about. It's nothing. It's really, it's nothing and it's everything. It's nothing in that it's such a tiny little blip in the world, but it's everything in that to that person, you know, the whole starfish story, you know, I threw a starfish back on the ocean, but why'd you do that? There's thousands of starfish that have washed up here. They're all going to die. Yeah, but it made a difference to that one, you know? So you make a difference to that one individual, but then the ripple effect you hope is, is massive. So I'm gonna I want to change subjects, but I'm gonna segue. Yeah, let's into talk about it. death. Yeah, we're gonna talk about death. We're gonna talk more about death. We're gonna talk about death, okay? Because that's just a conversation that you know. As I get older, it just seems it's more on the forefront of your mind. You just think about it more. As time goes by, and it's like I'm watching my kids grow. Anyways, we're not gonna get into that. What I want to talk about is this idea because criminal defense lawyers, criminal defense attorneys, are a breed of their own. Like personal injury lawyers, in my mind, we have we're wired a certain way to help people, represent people, and change make big impacts and i see there's a very similar hard hard wiring with criminal defense lawyers where even if someone does something wrong they commit a crime there's something hardwired and i could never do it right or if i was called upon i would do it and i would put my best effort into it you could do it by the way oh no you think i know you can't? No, i know that i could and i was thinking about this in the context of some of the most heinous cases that we've seen recently we're going to talk about I, I've I've got a death case right now. The facts you'd go, oh my God, get off my show. I can't believe you're representing that guy. But there's but there's a way to do it. But keep going. So that's what I'm trying to say is how do you reconcile or at least how do you reconcile the this the positive attitude and the the all these different things that you do for yourself to being able to walk into court and represent some of the worst of the worst? Because there's no contradiction. Where you explained I'll put you on the defensive. Where's the contradiction? Now you'll sound judgy. Well, because no, you're I'm representing not, I the don't bag. see. I, I don't see the contradiction. I see. I see it as like a calling. It's like I'm here to help this person who's been accused of something, and maybe they did it. But my job is is very specific. It's in this particular case. It's either I'm not even trying to walk him. I just don't want him to go to death. I don't want him to be put to death. There we go. That's my look at that's you. My we mission here. Keep going. You're doing great, Mark. <laughs> no, keep going. That's you're, what I'm saying. But I, you're, or or. The guy really did do it, and I have to depose the, the, the victim, and I'm going to treat that victim with love and respect and admiration while still zealously defending my client. What an opportunity. Do I really have to rip her head off? Do I have to treat her like shit? Do I have to make her seem like she's lying? I don't have to do that. Not in every case. So there's a way that I could still zealously defend my client and still show everyone as much love as possible and respect. Yeah. Yeah. I was in a uh, uh, in the Nicholas Cruz case here in South Florida. The kid who went into a school, active shooter, horrific. I know we're going to talk ancillary about the the Nicholas Cruz case in a minute, but obviously, obviously. Um, but uh, but I was in the deposition of one of the victims. I was there to represent her, and the public defenders that were there, and you probably know some of them, were so polite, so professional. And as soon as something came up where I said, "Listen, you're not going to show her that picture," or "I'm going to object to it," whatever, it was no problem, Eric. And they walked right around it. They did what they needed to do, and we walked down. And I, I appreciate there's a level of professionalism th that you have to respect. Because if, God forbid, I was in trouble, right, and I'm falsely accused, or, God forbid, I did something and I lost my mind for a minute, I would want a lawyer like you who has that passion to help somebody and defend them and protect them. Okay, let's take the flip side, too. There are days where I've, I've ripped people's heads off with my words. And sometimes it's justified when I find somebody to be lying to me, somebody who I need to test and see how they're going to be on the witness stand, right? But I do it where it's fair. Whatever I'm doing is fair. And if not, God blessed me with the words, hey, I'm sorry. I wanted to apologize. I just sent an email to a federal prosecutor. She came back and said, I thought I could you know, play with the enhancements, but no, it is sophisticated means. So I'll have a two levels for that. And I'll have the, and I, I just go, are you, so what's, what benefit is there for me to plead then? I mean, I might as well just go to trial. And I was going on and on and on. And I I said, I literally, the email said, I looked up in the dictionary under killing the messenger and it said, see Mark Iglarsh. And there was my face there. I said, I'm so sorry that I did that to you. And she goes, no, I, I totally understand. 
But so you just make amends. That's okay. You just say, I'm sorry. And you move on and you don't pull out the stick and hit yourself over the head with it. You know? All right. Let's, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, you have a high profile case coming up. Uh, at first off, I know you're in the news, you're being called upon a lot for different cases, for high profile cases, but tell, tell us a little bit about the case. You have opening statements or jury selection coming up in a big case involving the school shooting in, uh, in, uh, at Douglas, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in Parkland. Tell us a little bit about it. That's correct. Uh, it's state of Florida versus Scott Peterson. My client was the only deputy on campus armed with a gun, and they are charging my client with multiple counts of child neglect and culpable negligence, alleging that he's the coward of Broward, that he heard shots in the 1200 building, knew there were shots, knew kids were being killed, and just cowered in the corner. And I'm telling you, not just because I'm his lawyer, I'm telling you Mark Iglarch, the human being, has lost sleep over this case, and I've never lost sleep over a case in my life because he is innocent and should never have been charged. We as the public were completely misled by the facts that the media put out there. Is there a gag order in this kind of case no. right now? So so the media is able to report whatever they want to report. Correct. And how are, how are you able to respond, I guess, how, how do you respond to the media reports that have been coming out? Are you able to go and talk about it on the news, things like sure. that? Sure. I'm doing an interview right now with the Washington Post that should be coming out soon. The Another national one, it'll come to the Atlantic, I think it is. I talk to the media, and unfortunately, the local media, I think that they're afraid to write the truth. Things like the pronounced echo that existed there at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, that was never talked about by Sheriff Israel when he did that famous press conference. He should have gone in to kill the killer. Well, wait a second. Did you mention at that press conference that there was such a pronounced echo that 20 to 40 witnesses all stated they thought the shots were coming from outside? Some said the football field, which was hundreds of yards away. Some say the parking lot, which is in the other direction. Why didn't you say that? Did you mention that my client, by the way, ordered a code red, which kept all the kids back into the classroom and saved lives? Oh, except that one classroom where the teacher left his keys inside so all of his students couldn't get back in. And that teacher yelled, run! And those kids, many of them were shot. My client's being charged with the neglect of those kids. How fair is that? It's unfair. It, listen, I, 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 I want to hear the case. I want to see the case. Is it going to be televised on TV? Like, do you know whether it's going to be televised? I was told, for what it's worth, that Court TV is televising it. Law and Crime may, and another entity would. It's going to be heavily covered locally. But I'm not, I am so not focused on that. If they drop the case tomorrow, I'll take my 15 minutes and forego, right? I want this man who, for 32 years, dedicated his life and then for four minutes and 15 seconds, which is the only time that my client was on the scene when the shooter was on the scene. Shooter was on the scene for only six minutes and 36 seconds. My client, four minutes and 15 seconds. So in that four minutes and 15 seconds, he became a criminal, according to the prosecution. Hero to criminal in four minutes and 15 seconds. And during that time, on his dispatch transcript, you can see my client saying, hey, Perry, does he know where the shooter is? He's asking a fellow officer where the shooter is. What is that evidence to you, sir? I asked Sheriff Israel. He goes, I guess he didn't know where the shooter was. Then how can you tell the media, the world, and then have Trump parrot what you're saying, that he doesn't care about kids, he didn't go in, he's a loser? Really? This is the importance that, that the, the general public just doesn't know everything that's going on. The question is, when the first shots were fired, how come he didn't go in? Right? right? It would have been my question, right? You hear shots? Okay. So when we break it down at... 22525, because that's exactly when Aaron Feist, Coach Aaron Feist, had the unfortunate circumstance of opening the door on the west side of the 1200 building. And then Cruz had just finished shooting kids on the first floor. And he and there's Aaron Feist, boom, 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 he shoots him dead with the door open. And then Aaron Feist falls dead right outside the door. So the door is open. That's why those initial shots to almost everyone sounded like they were coming from outside, not inside the building. Plus, the building is 73 yards long, three quarters of a football field. It's massive. I'm telling the judge, we've got to bring the jury there. I don't know if he's going to rule in my favor, but you've got to be able to see how when Aaron Feist is shot on the west side of the 1200 building and my client literally is on the opposite side, the doors of the east side, there is no conceivable way he should know that the shots are coming from inside the 1200 building and the kids are being harmed. Then the next round of shots 
He's essentially under sniper fire because shots are being fired over his head. He doesn't know where they're coming from, but no cop, unless it's on some cheesy cop drama, is going to come jumping out going, okay, I'm going to figure out you know, where these are coming from. No, him and other cops took a tactical position of cover waiting for someone to tell them where the shots are coming from. And I will tell you this, this is something that people should be protesting and are outraged by. All the 911, but Mark, one would ask, kids called in and said kids are being killed in the, in the 1200 building, right? He should know that. Those calls went to Coral Springs, not BSO. We have the transcript. At no time did BSO transmit to my client in real time that shots were being fired from inside the 1200 building, that kids were being harmed. All that went to Coral Springs. And the officers on the scene never shared it with my client because they erroneously believed that my client knew all that information already. What's the theme? Give me the theme. Your, your tri- Do you have a trial theme that you've thought of for this he's, case? He, he's not a criminal. He's not a criminal. They're saying he's a criminal, that what he did was criminal. This is not um, about money, 51% lower burden of proof. This is an administrative hearing. Did he follow everything that he was supposed to do? And by the way, I believe he did. His, his policy was you may confront the shooter. Now it's you shall. They literally changed it. So at the time, you may. So he's following exactly what he was allowed to do. We're not falling on that sword. We're saying he didn't know where the shots were coming from, which is, you know, after the Las Vegas shooting, you know, he's, he's worried there's a sniper, you know. Um, but yeah, I'm the dividing line is he's not a criminal. Hopefully you realize he did nothing wrong. But if you think, well, he could have, should have, is it a criminal act? Is what he did a criminal act? And I don't think that there's any jury in this universe if they come in there with an objective, open state of mind that will feel that he is a criminal. Is it, a, is it child neglect counts for every single kid that, was, that lost their lives? On the third floor where they think, you know, I mean, obviously you can't hold him accountable for people who were killed when he wasn't even on the scene, right? And there was no one killed on the second floor. So the only ones that he was present for would have been the third floor. So the idea is he's supposed to hear these shots from over 73 yards away with a door that was open, right? And or shots that are going right over his head where he reasonably believes that he's dealing with a a sniper, okay? And that somehow he's going to go into the building, get up to the third floor, kill the killer to protect the kids, even though it took a full SWAT team 30 minutes to clear the first floor, clear the second floor, and make their way to the third floor. It makes no sense. Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't, tactically equipped was he carrying an ar-15 or helmet and no you know? they wouldn't let him you're not allowed no no vest no nothing Did he have a vest on no he didn't have a vest no on. vest no so uh, a cheesy episode of, of blue bloods he's supposed to just run into the building and know exactly where the shooter is do you know the kids on the on the third floor when i deposed him i said when did you first hear shots they go when cruz was on the third floor wait you didn't hear him shooting up on the first floor or second floor then nope I actually went to high school there, and it is a completely, it was an open, open floor plan. Everything is outside. When you say whether it's outside or inside, as I recall, when I was there, I don't remember any inside hallways, to be honest. I mean, there everything is now, it's an outside school, outside courtyards. All the doors to the classrooms were on the outside when, I, when you would go to, and I don't know whether the 1200 building, whatever building that is, are there actually internal hallways at that particular building? Yes. Yes. I don't know how many, hall- listen, I'm, what I'm saying is, when I was there, there may have been one or two buildings that had internal hallways, but most of the buildings didn't have that, at least what, from what I remember, unless they've changed the design. Yeah, no, the, the issue is, don't take my client's word for it that it was difficult to discern where the shots are coming from. One by one, I'm pulling people from their vacations this summer, and they're coming in to say, after that they knew, these people were questioned, after they knew that the shooter was inside the 1200 building, they're going to say, no, I know that the shooter was in there, but at the time, I thought he was at the football field, hundreds of yards away. I thought he was, I mean, the each four one. Minute, your four minutes is a big thing. There's, there, there's probably a great theme with that four minutes. Four minutes, four minutes they want to t- take him from hero to zero, right? And everything, his entire life, everything he's done, all the great things that he did at the school, you had four minutes where he's actually, he is coordinating. There's mass confusion. How often does a shooting like this happen? And then I guess, you know, listen, you know, you could, I guess part of my theme would be is what were the, the, the management and the procedures that were in place? What were they telling, what was already in place to protect the kids? Cause is it him that didn't follow the rules or did the other people, did his superiors not put in the policies or the procedures in place to protect the kids? Mm-hmm. I mean, all, all good ideas. My, my mind is completely still evolving. I finally just got what I 
what I think that I'm going to lead with. I just posted a cool TikTok yesterday. Of On this case? A gift. No, a, no, fun stuff. A gift that my wife got that we gave for Mother's Day, a very special gift. So I would go to that. Yeah. A huge box. I had to get two of them. I cut the, the middles out so it'd be a big box. And she like, you know, opens it up. And my son came home from college and he was in there. I'm giving away the punchline. Now you don't have to see it, but it's still beautiful. It was such Wait, a legitimately like he was in a box in a box. Yeah. <laughs> I just cut the bottom out. So we put them underneath it. And then that's put it much like this. better than, than, than my gift. My gift was ter- My gift was very, very weak. I just went out and bought a bunch of steaks. They were Wagyu though. So they're pretty good. Okay. Can you really tell the difference? Is it that much better? Oh man. An A5 Wagyu is a whole different. Really? Because we're on a different really? level. I'll tell you the place to go. I don't know that I want to get into that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to know from that. How, yeah, I do. Uh, occasionally. But then once you've had that, everything else this filet from Morton's is crap. All right. So listen, this case is coming up. We're going to be watching it. Um, uh, the defendant's name is Scott Peterson, not to be confused with the Scott Peterson from yeah. California. Mine who has murdered one his T, wife. S-C-O-T. But it is amazing how many people, when I've, throughout the case, I've posted a few things like, I can't believe you represent that scumbag. He, blah, blah, and, I, and, then, and then I'll write back and say, well, you don't realize he didn't know where the shots are coming from. They're like, oh, wait, shots? What are you talking? Oh, I thought you were representing the guy from California. So people have confused my Scott Peterson with that one. But in the sch- in the scheme of the cases that you handle, right? Like this is one where, like, if someone, if I were called upon, I would jump. I would help. I would help. I would do it. If someone said, "Eric, we need you. We need you to do this," it's those. This is a case where he's not the criminal criminal. He's not the murderer. You want to talk about my guy who's facing a death penalty? You have guys that are bad, bad people, right? Those are ones where I get it. And <laughs> they've been accused of bad, bad things. Right. At worst, that's what they did. That their conduct is <laughs> like <at> you. <laughs> you know, these are bad, bad people. Well, you know, I don't know that they are. That's ju- that's that's ju- that's judgment. I'm not here to judgment's judge. a thief of serenity. I'm saying that some of their actions, uh, you know, are are pretty problematic. Yeah. I thought to myself, like the Nicholas Cruz case, like I don't do the criminal cases. I don't handle criminal defense work. I don't I, I don't handle uh, murder cases. I don't represent uh, pedophiles or child molesters or oh, whatever. You're so much better than me. No, but what I'm saying is like I thought to myself and I really labored about this is what if like the governor or somebody called me up and said, Eric, there's this kid, Nicholas Cruz. And I'm like, I've seen the headlines, horrific thing. We need you to come in and do and represent him and help and, and defend him like you're being called upon. As my oath as a lawyer, right? I don't want to do it, but if I was called upon, would I have the skills to do it? Well, of course, of course, you're, you're a brilliant lawyer. Of course you would. But here's the thing. You know that that case is solely defined by trying to save his life. And your job would be to present mitigating factors, right? That three jurors found to be greater than the aggravating factors. That's all you're doing. You, that doesn't mean you. In fact, you can get up there and say what he did was absolutely abhorrent. In fact, just so you know, it's not going to be fake. When I talk about the deaths that he caused in my case, I will be crying. These parents suffered. I, I'm serious. I can get very emotional right now. I can't. It's the, my greatest nightmare is what they're living. Jury selection. You know, I'm going to point to them and I'm going to say, folks. They they lost their children. Have you done death penalty cases before? How many? A few. Two. Okay. I, I don't usually get involved. You're not involved in them. Death penalty cases, I mean, and but you've handled murder. You've handled plenty first of murder degree cases. murder. I've cases. handled everything else. Yeah. Wow. Plenty. It's a. It's a. Wow. What? Some of the people who died are were are criminal are, are career criminals. Like no one's crying over that. I've heard you know? I've heard defense lawyers, and again, I'm not saying, but I've heard defense lawyers say, take that position. Like, listen, the person that was killed was a bad person you know like this there was there was either the self-defense that was involved or this, you know i've heard i've heard it all i've heard a bunch of victims different victims one day defendants the next but no you have true loss in the nicholas cruz case these kids I, again i i can't think of anything worse so but but here's what we have to say ladies and gentlemen of the jury take a look at those people over here i'm not gonna wait you, you'll figure it out at some point they lost their kids would everyone agree with me that you'd want to do it anything you could to relieve them of even an ounce of their pain? Yeah, everybody? Good, of course. If you learn that some of them believe erroneously that my client committed a crime or criminal acts and they want a conviction, would you maybe lower the burden of proof for the prosecutor, make it easier for him to get a conviction just because you know it's going to relieve their pain a little bit? We'll see. Maybe then you get them for cause. Then they're gone, right?
Let's see. We'll see. What in your history allows you the courage to be able to look at them and just say, this wasn't a criminal case? This is Peterson's uh, jury yeah. selection. I'd love to talk to you about jury selection. You're a trial animal, man, like me, okay? You know, you got to come animal? up with the question. I don't know. Yeah, I, I've don't got know. a history. I've done a lot. I stopped counting at 150. I, I do. I've done a lot of trials. Wow. All right. Let's change subject because everyone likes to talk about the Brian Koberger case. Who? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So this is Koberger. Is the uh, that he's been charged with first degree, uh, multiple counts of first degree murder in Idaho of uh, these four college kids. Absolutely tragic, horrific. You can't even imagine to think of the like pure hatred and evil and like uh, I don't even know the words to put it to use a knife. That kind of a crime, right? And now you have this guy who's been arrested. What do you take from the affidavit? Like, what do you get? What do you, what's your your view of this case? I think the analysis has to start with something that you probably don't expect, and that is when you heard about what had happened. Right? We didn't have anybody caught yet. You envisioned what somebody would be looking like. If everybody sketched or looked up pictures, I bet almost no one would have pictured his face. Now, who does that help? It helps him because the first thing is. Wait, that just seems weird. We've become accustomed to his face now. We've we've looked at him as the devil, so maybe it's easier for us. But first impression is like, really? Him? Really? That helps him. Let me tell you something. DNA doesn't help him. DNA doesn't help him. Right. When I when I just, I don't know if you saw the video, there was a, another recent video that was released of an interaction between him and a police officer. You would never get a single inkling that this is an evil First degree murder right, person. Right. At and all. everyone thinks they can tell who somebody is, even though I've learned you never know anything about anybody. Okay. So those jurors who start to judge him by how he looks and his interactions, right? They got it wrong, man. Potentially. Right. So that that's the first thing and the best thing that helps him. Like you wouldn't expect somebody like that to do this. Criminal defense lawyers would attack the DNA how? Contamination? First of all, they would attack it from beginning to end. Everything, no stone unturned. So first of all, who, who says that it's his DNA? Why? How is it gathered? How is it analyzed? What, what was the chain of custody? You know, how was it handled? You know, we, we learned from OJ, you can co allegedly contaminate a scene. Whether that was accurate or not, you get the guys who write the book on it to come in and say it wasn't done right. Garbage in, garbage out. They're saying it's him, but you don't just get to do that. There's stuff that goes into that. And these people aren't scientists. If you can get experts to say it wasn't done right, then boom, it, it wasn't done right in their minds. There's reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. There are experts. I guarantee there's experts for everything, right? You got you got you got a deep pockets. You'll pay for it, you know. And 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 they'll have experts to say potentially if that's what this case comes down to, that there was something done incorrectly with the DNA. Yeah. And then you got to think if he's such a like he's this criminal. Uh, uh, you know, he's got this master's degree in criminology. He's getting a PhD. And I watch this interaction, and he sits there telling the police officer he admits what he did wrong. He he was talking about how he, you know, oh, yeah, I pulled in, but I didn't think I was doing wrong. But I did know, yep, I, you know, I did know, except for the fact I was blocking the crosswalk. Like, it's almost, like, very interesting to me that he would, like, with his mind, the, or who he's supposed to be. How do you leave behind the sheath if you're the one that did it, right? Well, you flip that. That's the argument. A guy with his experience, if it was really him, would never have left the sheep behind. That's what I mean. There you go. That's a, that's an argument I think they can potentially make. You sure. Know? Um, There's no plea there. I mean, that guy's not pleading, you know? I mean... And I think I'm convinced that if by now there was evidence that really, truly exonerated him or that there there's DNA that shows it wasn't him or there's no DNA in other places or there aren't more things that are tying him, that would be known or at least... They wouldn't want, I wouldn't, I don't see why they would want a gag order. The, the defense would want a gag order to keep that quiet because the reason you get a gag order is why. So the jury doesn't know. Co correct. I, I want to stop the prosecutors from poisoning my jurors and saying more and more reasons why my, listen, it was Sheriff Israel's one year anniversary as the Opelaka police chief. Friends are calling me. Did you see his interview? I go, no, what do I care about that? Because he took another stab at my client in the case that I have. Would I wish that that didn't air and didn't become? Of course, you know, but you can't stop things. So you don't want prosecutors poisoning, you know, jurors. How do you feel? Okay, so we're going to, with, you know, Koberger, obviously, they're going to try to push the trial out. They're going to try to keep the gag order in place as much as possible. And then 
even if the preliminary hearing is made public, they're going to want to have this trial at least some long period of time down the road, a year, whatever, so that at least minds dissipate, right? Sure. Cases, cases for the defense always get better with age like wine. Always. Memories fade. Things get lost. Police officers get in trouble. Always delay. I'm not saying I do it on purpose. I need time to prepare. That's what I'm doing. But in the interim, I assure my clients, your case is only getting better. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I, listen, how many times when I was a prosecutor, I have a DUI case, and then all of a sudden the DUI pr uh, police officer gets charged with something and then that case is gone we have no witness so we're crystal clear i am never intentionally delaying a case for that purpose and the fact that the peterson case has now taken five years to finally come to trial there are reasons why we could still extend it for another continuance but i'm just it's time you know starting next week wow wow um what what about with jury selection and dealing with jurors who have hurt, like, is there a, is there a level of where you say, okay, you've heard about this, you've heard about him, you have to go. Like, how, how do you, how is that person, does it have to affect them? And they say, yeah, listen, I've seen all this stuff and I just can't set it aside. I'm going to not, I can't be fair. Well, that's an easy one. Those, they're gone for cause challenges and cause challenges are when they innately can't be fair. But you're asking me, I'm asking you like, what if this person says, oh, I've seen all about it and I've watched it, what if, but I haven't made up my mind. I want to see more. Okay. So obviously it's unreasonable for me to think that I'm going to have six jurors who have never heard about this case. I'm looking for ones who have heard the least because I just want somebody who comes in there and says, wait, what is this about? I'm winning that case. I don't lose sleep if I know I have a juror like that. What's causing me to lose sleep is people who've already prejudged the case, stealth jurors who claim, oh, I could be fair. And if by that, I mean, I'll sit here and wait and then I'll find him guilty, you know, regardless of what you present. Those are the ones that keep me up at night. Do you remember? I don't know if you watched the George Zimmerman case. It was Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman. Every night on television, on television talking but about do you remember, it? Yeah. I think what the defense attorney said during jury selection, one of the very first things he said is um, knock, knock. And they said, who's there? George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman who? And the idea was he was trying to get this this almost joke of like. You guys aren't supposed to even know who he is, right? You're not, if you've heard about this in the news, you got to let us know, you got to know, you know, and they want jurors to so, not know. So I successfully petitioned the court to have a special questionnaire given to the jurors. What questions, I, I came out with 10 great questions. Judge said, no, I think I can give most of these. I don't know if he'll give all of them, but for jurors to go into detail as to what they know, what they've heard about both the Cruz case and my case, and then I'll have further questioning of them. And I'm not just, so you think you can set it aside? I'm looking at them in the eyes. I'm saying, what have you heard? I need to know. And we're doing this. Why jury selection is going to take a long time because I'm not going to let them poison the panel. This is one on one. And then once they tell me, I said, how are you able to set that aside? What in your life allows you the ability to somehow not think about a pink elephant wearing a Nazi helmet on a unicorn? cycle juggling like how are you able to put that out of your head you know and let them convince me they can well this is all good stuff we're going to wrap it up but i do want to talk real quickly okay about how we met which i think was really really cool then so we get to talk about five you. minutes yeah i just i want to talk real quickly about this okay but because i had i had heard about you i'd seen you'd written books and stuff and it was during the pandemic and the world shut down, and I decided for whatever reason, I just opened up my own law firm. I was going to start using social media to create videos to help other people. And I started creating videos on how to do Zoom depositions. And out of the blue, you sent me an email. You go, you said something like, I just watched this video, and you just saved me, or something like that. And I was, really? yeah, it was weird. I okay. picked up the phone. We end up talking because there was a way to like transition from you know, showing the, an exhibit then still being able yes. to see yourself and you had to do all something and I had, Dude, did a video. Dude, you're the one who taught me that? That was me. Okay, all right, so let, here's my recollection. For me to have reached out to you means it was something extraordinary. I, I would not, I'm telling you, it means not only was the information like valuable, but I was captivated by what you were doing. I was impressed. There's no question I never would have reached out to you otherwise. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I still use that. I have that in my notes section of my phone. And every time I'm trying to do that when I'm on, you know, a Zoom and I'm because I've done many presentations, I, I don't know how to. So, yes, thank you. So I reached out to you. And then now we get to talk about you for a second. 
yeah, I'm super impressed with what you're doing. You're putting yourself out there. People are, are hungry, thirsty for content from a creative, good looking guy, you know, and you're putting it out there and you're fun and you don't take yourself too seriously. I think it's wonderful. I think that's what I want in a lawyer. So yeah, someone who's down to earth and you that's know. it. That's it. Listen, I just I made a decision that I think this type of content people like to watch it, and then I also like to promote other people. You know what I mean? Like you're a great criminal defense lawyer, and people need to know that. People need to be able to find a great lawyer if they have some type of issue, whether it's immigration law or family law or criminal defense or probate law. They need to be able to find somebody, and they shouldn't have to just go into the you know yellow pages if they still do that or Google or whatever and take a risk. Let's make it worth their while to commit a criminal offense. I will take 20% off your next felony. <laughs> Listen, whatever you do, don't get in trouble, okay? He doesn't that. want to represent you. I meant you. that. I meant yeah. that. I was making a joke. For the bar, again, I'm just making a joke. It was a joke. Well, listen, um, I, I'm thrilled that you came today. Um, we had a great conversation. There's going to be a bunch of content. I'm going to cut this stuff up. We're going to post it everywhere. And guys, if uh, if you're watching this live session, make sure you go to Mark Iglarsh, his page, follow his TikTok, because he's got a bunch of cool stuff. And really, listen, on the he's got the criminal defense side of stuff. But then beyond that, he actually is a genuinely good person that wants to help other people f have happiness in their life. And that, listen, I do. at the end of the day, you want to live your life. And then one day at, and when you're on your deathbed, you're going to look back and you're going to say, look at all those chapters in your life and say, wow, that was amazing. Right. You know what? Yes. But I'm not waiting till my deathbed. I want to write this second because this may be the only second I have. I want to, number one, look at it and say, I'm so blessed that in this second, in this moment where happiness is found, I'm just sitting here with you. I don't have any other problems. I got nothing in the world. I'm sitting here right now and I'm super present and I'm really enjoying myself. And secondly, I feel really good about what I've done today, I, what I've done in this moment, you know, and, and I don't wait till my deathbed. You know, it's, it's right here right now because who knows whether I'm going to be on my deathbed. I might go in the car crash on the way home. I don't know. Isn't that, wouldn't that be weird? Hold on. Wouldn't that be weird if that really did happen? Listen, I love you all. I wish you the very best, right? If all of a sudden, I don't know. I don't know. What's gonna, so, so let's live this moment right now. Let's make it the best that we can. The very best. Mm -hmm. All right, my friend. I appreciate you coming. Thank you, my friend. Good stuff.